Um, I'm truly blessed to be able to connect with each and every one of you. And so I pray that so far your week has been blessed and uh, praise the Lord for the final Herald and the work that it's doing. And so um, as was mentioned, I invite you to let others know and uh, we'll be going over the book of Revelation. Today we're going to be starting Revelation chapter one. And so I just put together some simple slides. We'll be doing more searching through the scriptures. And as time goes on, it will become more detailed in terms of picture form. But today we're just going to be laying the foundation by looking at Revelation chapter one. And so I pray that you will be blessed and I'll, I'll share my PowerPoint and then let's have a word of prayer. One second. There we go. All right, put this up here. Okay. So let's have a word of prayer as we go into our subject today. Father in heaven, illuminate our minds and guide us as we cover this aspect of revelation made plain, revelation made simple. I pray that our hearts and minds might be drawn out to you and that as we look at this book, we may see its central figure and its purpose, even in chapter one. We thank you so much for these things. In Jesus Christ, blessed name, amen. All right, so as we go into this subject, friends, um, this is, I'll share a little bit of my testimony. This is actually how I was brought into a greater understanding of the Bible. And so uh, it was the year 2005, I was the age of 16 in high school, public high school within the United States. And uh, as I was going there, just coming a few years prior from the country of Trinidad and Tobago, um, I was uh, best friends, one of my best friends, he ended up uh, through a certain series of events happening in his life, coming more and more closer to Jesus Christ. And so there was prophecy, there were prophecy meetings that he was going to concerning the book of Revelation. I had read the book of Revelation four times, yet I never understood what it really meant. And so friends, this was amazing. Uh, he invited me to the series. And so we went to the series. And I, as I went there, um, it blew my mind. This was in the area of Silver Spring, Maryland. And so as I went there each night, as the preacher connected the contents of the book of Revelation, my heart was moved and it was moved so much that I was completely sold to the true message of the book of Revelation. And this message in this book, if not correctly understood, you could think it's about dragons, it's about locusts, and that these things are literally to appear at the end of time. But we're going to learn some crucial principles that causes the book, yes, in a sense to be less scary in its more literal sense, but even more solemn and at the same time, more joyful as we look at what it really means. And so you'll see what I mean as we go into the subject. But from that moment on, friends, in my teenage years, I would go to my high school and share these messages with my friends and share it with uh, family members. And people were so stirred as they understood the contents of this book. And this is what I pray for us this day that as we look at the contents of the book of Revelation, the friends, our hearts will be stirred, even as we start off with chapter one. And so this is a little bit of my testimony and it, it, it resulted, to, it ended up to such an extent that friends, I dedicated the rest of my life to studying of the book of Revelation. Not only Revelation, but the books of Daniel, the entire Bible, but this book, the book of Revelation is actually my favorite book of the Bible. And so as we go into this subject, I pray that your hearts will be blessed. So I hope you have your Bibles with you. I have my Bible with me. We're going to Revelation chapter one, and we're gonna begin breaking down the principles in Revelation chapter one, all right? So let us go to the first section of Revelation chapter one, Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So go with me there, Revelation chapter one and verse one. And I'm going to read out verse one, and then we're going to come back and we're going to break it down. 
So the revelation, it begins by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing that we want to look at. The actual Greek translation in the New Testament, the Old Testament, the majority of it is translated from the Hebrew, the English translation that we get. However, as you switch over to the New Testament, the language that is predominantly used there is the Greek translation. So it is the Greek language, koin or koine Greek, translated into English, is how we get our English translation today. And so in the Greek, the word there for of can also be from. So it's both and. It's the revelation from Jesus Christ concerning Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning it's about him, and the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning it came from him. And so as we read it here, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. But notice, Christ even got this revelation of himself concerning what is supposed to be revealed concerning him. He got it from God. It says the revelation of Christ, from Christ, which Christ received from God. So it says, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So that means the book is pointing us forward. It's pointing us forward from John's day. So we're looking at aspects that's happening in John's day. What we're going to see as we're continuing in our study throughout the weeks coming, we're going to see John is talking about things happening in his day, things happening in the future of his day, all the way to the end of time, which means it's connecting to our day. And so this is something vital for us to look at as we study the subjects within the book of Revelation. It's not just concerning the past. It's not just concerning the present. It's also concerning the future, all the way to the end of time, all the way to your day and my day. Hence, it is pivotal that we understand what the book reveals. And in all of this, friends, Jesus is the center of it. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ, which he got from his father. So this is the first crucial point. Now, the second major point that we're going to look at is found in verse 1 as well. So it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And then it says how he gave it to us. It says he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So God and Jesus, they have an angel that has come to John the Revelator, also known as John the Apostle. And these, this angel that God has chosen, Jesus' angel, has come to reveal the contents of the book of Revelation to John the Apostle, we're going to see later on, for the seven churches and for us. So this is vital for us to understand. Why? Because in this one verse, we're seeing how the book is to be understood. It says he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So in this verse, we are seeing the symbolic language of the book of Revelation. Why? Because it was not only sent, but it was signified. What does that mean? That means, friends, that the book is given in signs. It was signified. The root word there for signified is sign. The idea is that the contents of the book is to be given in signs, or another word, is symbolic language. So the book of Revelation has a symbolic foundation. The majority, not all, but the majority of the book is given in signs and symbols. This is something crucial for us to understand. 
Because in our world today, what is happening is that as Christians come to the book of Revelation, they take the majority of it as literal. So what is the result? People are looking for literal dragons to show up at the end of time. They're looking for literal locusts to start showing up all over the world. So as they look out in certain parts of Africa or in certain aspects of the Middle East and they, they see locusts starting to swarm in different places, they're saying this is a fulfillment of the book of Revelation, not realizing that this is not what Revelation was talking about. Friends, it's not that literal dragons are coming. It's not that literal locusts are coming. It's not that literal beasts will rise up out of the earth or out of the sea. It is symbolic language that is to be unlocked. Signs that are to be deciphered, unlocked, unraveled, unfurled, so that we can understand what it's really saying. So this is vital for us to understand as we continue studying, because we're gonna come across symbols that we're gonna realize need to be unlocked. And the way that they will be unlocked is by the Bible itself. The Bible is its own interpreter. All right, so I pray that that makes sense to each and every one of us. So we're seeing so far what? The book of Revelation comes from Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of him. It was given to him by his father that it might be given through him to his angel, to his servant John. We're going to see for the seven churches, which includes us. So the book covers from John's day all the way to the end of time. All right. So this is vital for us to understand, and it's given in signs and symbols. Majority of it is symbolic language that needs to be unlocked with the rest of the Bible. In Revelation, all of the books of the Bible meet their end. They meet their ultimate fulfillment. Therefore, to interpret it, we must go back to the other books of the Bible because it refers to other stories that we're going to, it's going to, we're going to recognize it. We're going to understand, wow, okay, I remember this story. This comes from somewhere else in the Bible. And as we go back to it, we will begin to learn how to unlock it. So I pray that that makes sense to each and every one of us. This is something that by and large Christendom has forgotten. And I say forgotten because the apostles John, when he wrote it, he understood what was to be done in order for its truths to be unlocked. The book of Revelation, the truths within it to be unlocked. But many within Christianity today have missed this. They have bypassed it. So the result is they're looking at the book. And then they're looking at the news. And then they're taking the news and they're interpreting the book rather than allowing the book to interpret the events that are happening today and that have happened in history. So as we move forward now with this understanding, there is a blessing. This is going to bring us back again to Christendom. It says, and I'll read actually from verse two, it says, who bear record. So John bears record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus. We'll come to that later on in our series of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So John is writing everything that he's seeing unveiled to him in vision. He is writing it out so that we can have it. Now notice what verse 3 says. This is the beatitude, one of the beatitudes of the book of Revelation. It says, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And not only here, but keep, in other words, live in harmony with what they heard. Keep those things which are written therein. For why? The time for these things that are written in the book, the time has come for those things to be fulfilled. What's written in the book is soon to happen. 
Therefore, God is saying to us, it is imperative, it is crucial for us to understand what the book is talking about, friends. And so what does it say? It doesn't say afraid. It doesn't say fearful is he that reads. It says blessed is the person who reads the contents of this book. Now, this is very interesting because the word blessed there literally means to be happy. So God is desiring to give us a happiness uh, from the word of God. And one of the ways which we get that happiness is by studying the book that is one of the most solemn and most intense books of the Bible. But God says happy is the one who understands it. And I know what that means, friends. In coming to understand through going to the prophecy series that I mentioned to you at the beginning, sharing a little bit of my testimony, seeing how the prophecies can be broken down, how it can be understood, how it's not really dragons and, and, and beasts that will rise up and locusts that will swarm the earth, but realizing its symbolic language and how the Bible interprets itself and how the symbols of revelation can be unlocked. Friends, my mind was blown away. It brought such joy to my life that it changed my life. It changed it, and it caused me to be brought closer to Jesus, who is the fountain of joy, the fountain of peace. Are you looking for peace today in Jesus? Christ says, come to the book of Revelation. Understand what it really means. Fear not, but rather be blessed. Be happy as you understand the truths that are within this book. So we're going to unlock some of these truths even today. And so as we go forward, it says, blessed is he that reads. Blessed, happy is he that reads. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, let's stop there with not only hear, but keep. Friends, the crucial thing for us to understand is this. You cannot keep something that you cannot understand. You cannot keep. You cannot hear. The word hear in this text actually means to understand. So once it's understood, there is a happiness that comes with it. But there's also with that understanding the ability to keep to live in harmony with the things that you're reading. Why is this so important? The reason is because before I started learning these truths that we're gonna go over in the series, I used to be of the opinion that the majority of the book of Revelation could not be understood. And so hence what happened is I, while I read the book, I, I never really made any efforts to understand the book. Because I thought I was being told by my pastors, I was being told by my elders of different churches that I was going to, that the book could not be understood, especially from chapter 3 onward. But what I came to realize is that contrary to what many professors or many pastors or elders say within Christianity today, Jesus says through his apostles. John, he says what? He says, blessed is he that reads, but not only reads, but he that understands, he that hears the words of this prophecy, and not only understands, but keeps, live in harmony with the things that he has understood. Because why? The time is at hand. That means the book can be understood, friends. The book can be understood. Hence, Endeavor to understand the book of Revelation. Do not look at it as though it's closed, as though it is sealed, not to be understood until sometime way in the future. Friends, the book can be understood now. It can be understood today. So we have looked at a few things. The book is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus Christ. It is from Jesus Christ. It is the testimony he has received concerning himself 
from his father, and he has given it to John through his angel in signs and symbols for us to be blessed, for us to understand, and for us to keep those things which are written in the book. So now we go on to our next part. Now, John receives the truths of this book from the angel in vision concerning Jesus Christ and concerning the things which are soon to come. He receives all of these things to pass it on to a certain group. And this is where we go to verse 11. So let's skip down to verse 11. We're going to come back to the prior verses to look at some of the, the things there. But let's go to verse 11. It says, Jesus is now speaking, saying, I am Alpha and Omega. That means Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter. It says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, right? It says, and what you see, write in a book. This is the book we're reading now, the book of Revelation. And send it to who? The seven churches which are in Asia. So in other words, why did John write the book? It was in order to pass it on. He was writing the contents of the book of Revelation in symbolic language to be unlocked by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, of course, so that he can give it to the seven churches. So we're going to understand more and more who these seven churches are, but I'm going to mention them here today. It says, what you see right in a book, and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. And who are the seven churches? Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Tyathira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, these seven churches, friends, are to be viewed in two ways. And we're going to come to that as we come to the seven churches. The book of Revelation is written in sevens. It has a number of sevens throughout it. For example, the seven angels to the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. You have the seven last plagues. All of these sevens are laid out throughout the entire book. And friends, it's powerful because as we look at this, we're going to see that the seven churches were literal churches that existed in John's day. But we're also going to see that the seven churches are symbols of church ages from the time of John, the revelator, all the way to the end of time. In other words, starting with John's time, you have the first church, and it goes throughout the church ages until you get to the last generation, the final generation, where we get to the church of Laodicea. And so we're going to realize, yes, it's literal churches in John's day that he's giving the truths of the book of Revelation to. But at the same time, each church represents an age of the church spanning from John's time all the way to the end of time. Friends, you don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss that. It's vital. What that means then is in order to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand history. If we don't understand history, we must become students of history. If we do not become students of history, we'll think all of the book of Revelation is just happening in our day. <laughs> but God wants us to realize that no, 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 no. Yes, it's for the end of time. There are aspects of it for the end of time, and we'll come to that. But in order to understand what happens at the end of time, we must understand what happened before our time. We must understand what took place in the past to understand how the past will be repeated in the present and in the future. I pray that this makes sense to each and every one of us, friends. This is imperative. It is vital for us to understand this. So the seven churches were literal, but it's also a symbol of the church ages spanning from John's time all the way to the end of time. So John is writing these things in the book of Revelation for the churches in his day and for beyond his day. All right. Now, in light of this, we're looking now at chapter one. We're going to see 
where these things come from. You remember, God, the Father, is mentioned in verse 1. Jesus Christ is also mentioned. But now we're going to see them mentioned again, but through other names. Remember, the testimony of Jesus Christ, this revelation of him, is coming from God through Jesus, through his angel, through John, to the seven churches, meaning to us. So it's coming from the Godhead to the human family. This is how we are to look at the book of Revelation. So go with me in your Bibles now. We're going backward to verse 4. All right? So John has, is saying, he, he's giving this message that concerns his time all the way to the end. And it says in verse 4, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. We just saw who the seven churches are. Grace be unto you and peace. Here it is. Here's God the Father. From him which is, which was, and which is to come. God the Father there. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now in the Bible, if you look at the number seven, the number seven in the Bible is a symbol of perfection. It's a symbol of completeness. You have in the, the, the book of Genesis, the creation story, you have God creating the world in six days and resting, meaning it's a cessation. It's a completion of his work. On the seventh day, he rests as a symbol that the work is finished. It is a symbol of completion, of perfection. All right. So when it says here, the seven spirits, there are seven aspects of the spirit. But really what we're talking about here is the Holy Spirit. So from the seven spirits, in other words, from the spirit that is complete, the Holy Spirit who is perfect. So what we're seeing here is the third person of the Godhead. The Father, him which is, that's past, which was, uh, him which is, that's present, was, that's past, and which is, that's present. All right? Which is to come, I should say, that's future. So you have present past and future, which is, which was, and which is to come. That's the father. It's, a, it's in a sense also the idea of the I am, the one who is ever present in every generation, in all phases of time. God is saying, I'm there. That's the father. And which, uh, and the seven spirits, that's the perfect spirit. Hence, some of your Bibles, the word spirit there, the S in the word spirit for some of your Bibles is in caps, meaning it's in reference to the Holy Spirit. So the perfect spirit, the spirit in whom is completeness, everything is within that spirit, the fullness of God. So that's the Holy Spirit. But we're missing one person. Let's keep going. And from Jesus Christ. There you go. We have him, the second person of the Godhead. So you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, with, who is the faithful witness. And here it is. There's an interesting language being used here. It says, and the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There is a reference to Calvary, to the crucifixion, to the cross. And has made us through that blood royalty, kings and priests, unto our God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So notice here it says kings and priests. Some of your Bibles have the phrase a kingdom of priests. All right. So we have been made a kingdom of priests through the blood that was shed on the cross. But notice Jesus is called the first begotten of the dead. Now many get they get, um, what's the word? They get tricked on this statement. The first begotten of the dead. When you look up this statement in the Greek, as we move forward in our studies, I'll, I'll bring on some, not only some PowerPoint slides, but I will bring on some, um, I'll help us to go to a website that we can reference. And as I have more resources, I'll share those resources with you. For more understanding. All right. So it actually says. The first begotten of the dead. The word first begotten here. Of the dead. Notice. It's not that Jesus was. 
Uh, it's alluding to Jesus's incarnation. It's alluding to his death, the first begotten of the dead. All right. The word there, first begotten, actually means in the original Greek language, it means one of a kind, a unique one from among the dead. And friends, this is alluding to Jesus's death because you remember, unlike the deaths that millions and even billions have experienced throughout the generations, Jesus's death is unique in that it is one of a kind. How so? Because through no other death can salvation be brought. And notice that's the context in which his death is mentioned. It's mentioned in light of the cross. The salvation that was wrought or the salvation that comes to us as a result of the cross, no other death could accomplish, friends. The death of Moses could not accomplish it. The death of the prophets could not accomplish it. The death of patriarchs could not accomplish it. They only pointed forward to it and they looked forward to that day when the savior would die. As Jesus said, Abraham looked forward to my day and he rejoiced. Why? Because Abraham knew that in the death of Christ, his salvation would be secured. All of the prophets testified and looked forward to the death of the Messiah as we testify and look backward to that death. Because it is in the death of Christ that we are not only made royalty, but in believing in that sacrifice and what it accomplished for us, the removal of the penalty of sin, which is death. Friends, we are saved. Hence, this death is unique. He is the first begotten from among the dead. A unique death for the purpose of the salvation of human beings. Not only that, friends, the death of Christ, this is powerful. The death of Jesus Christ upon Calvary was so powerful that when it comes to the resurrection, because he never sinned and there was no reason other than the purpose of paying the penalty of death and forgiving us power to over or, or the penalty of sin and forgiving us the power to overcome sin, friends. Jesus never sinned once. Hence, death could not hold him in the grave. Hence, he rose on the third day. And it was a resurrection that was done by God, raised up by the Spirit, the apostles tell us, in the New Testament. So this is powerful. Unlike many others, it's not that somebody raised Jesus, another human came and pronounced something and raised Jesus from the dead. No, God called Christ forth from the grave. So this is a unique death and resurrection experience that we're looking at here, like no other. And this is what the word first begotten means. It's one of a kind. It's the first of its kind. Never more to be repeated, by the way. Jesus' death is unique. And it is the only one of its kind in past, present, and future. I pray that this makes sense. So now we are seeing the entire Godhead just in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. All right. So I pray that all that we've looked at makes sense. We've seen God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead in this first chapter of the book of Revelation. We're laying foundations and we'll see them appear more and more throughout the book of Revelation. All right. Now. We're going to a concept here that is crucial for us to understand because we're looking at, we don't want to just see Jesus, but what the Bible reveals to us is where Jesus is in light of what we're studying. And so as we look at this, I pray that friends, you have your pens and paper with you because we're going to look at something here that will help to catapult us in the rest of of the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 1 verses 12 through 20. All right, so notice 
John hears this voice saying, I am Alpha and Omega. That's verse 11. Now in verse 12, I want us to see this, all right? It says, and I turn to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now remember that. It says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Now hold your fingers there with me in your Bibles. And I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Hold your fingers there in Revelation chapter 1. And I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Who is this son of man standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks? Who is this son of man? Go with me in your Bibles to Matthew 16. We're going to Matthew 16 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. All right. And actually, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. All right. Jesus was just speaking about the doctrines, the false doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then look at what he says here. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, when Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So notice what Jesus does. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. So when we go in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, and we see in Revelation 13 that in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man stood clothed with a garment down to the foot, we know that we're speaking in reference to Jesus. Jesus is the one standing in the midst of these seven candlesticks. Now, friends, in the Old Testament, the seven-branch candlestick was found in the holy place of the sanctuary. All right? It was found in the holy place. There was a sanctuary in the Old Testament, and the sanctuary was made up of three compartments. All of these things, just remember these things, and we're going to come to these things and explain them. But there was a sanctuary system in the Old Testament, a place that God made, had the Hebrews make, in which he can dwell among them. And so that sanctuary had three aspects, a courtyard where animals were sacrificed and where the priests washed their hands before entering into the next compartment, which is the holy place, which we're looking at right now. And then the last part, which the high priest entered into once a year, that was called the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. Now, the seven branch candlestick was an article that was found in the holy place of the sanctuary, the first part of the tent of the sanctuary. And so Jesus Christ now, he's standing, friends, in the midst of the candlesticks, which tells us where Jesus is. How, what does that mean? In the Bible, I want you to take your Bibles, hold your fingers there in Revelation 1, and go with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, okay? Exodus chapter 25. We're going to see a crucial concept here. This is vital. Exodus chapter 25, and we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. And this is coming to our second to last slide. All right, we're breaking these things down so that we can understand them. Actually, this is our last slide. So we want to really focus here. All right, so it says in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. All right, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. This is what it states here. Now, Israel is bringing the context is that God is going to have Israel make him a house, make him a tent in which he can dwell in. And as he does this, he invites Israel to take part in giving of substances or contents that will be used to make this dwelling place for God. And so these things are mentioned from verses 1 to 7. But in verse 8, notice what it says. 
Why are these things brought together? It says, let them make me a sanctuary. That is a dwelling place that I may what? Dwell among them. God wanted to dwell in the midst of his people. He wanted to be close to them. This is the love of God, friends, that God didn't want to remain far off, but he wanted to come close to his people. But he knew that they could not behold the full revelation of his glory. So he had them make him a tent which he can dwell in. And they would have the evidence that he was in that tent by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, shooting out of that tent into the sky. Powerful. But notice what it says here. It says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The question is, okay, God, I, we understand that you want us to make a sanctuary. Moses probably says, okay, I understand that. But according to what am I to make this sanctuary? I don't have a pattern. I, I need something to work with. God knowing this, look at what he says in verse 9. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to, in other words, you're to make this sanctuary after the pattern of all that I show you. After the pattern of the tabernacle. In other words, there's some other tabernacle somewhere else. After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Do you see that? Friends, what God is revealing to us here is that Moses was to make, have the people make a sanctuary at his instruction after the pattern of another sanctuary somewhere else that God would show Moses and Moses would relate that to the people so they can make a replica. Friends, I wonder where this tabernacle is that Moses saw that he said, okay, I can make a replica of it. Because you remember that tabernacle has three parts, a courtyard, a holy place, and the holy of holies. Where is this place that Moses built an earthly sanctuary after? Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. All right, Hebrews chapter 8. This is powerful, friends. Hebrews chapter 8. This is what it says here. Speaking of Jesus, when he went to heaven, after his resurrection, he went in and out among his disciples for 40 days, and then he finally left for good, all right? Or for, I should say, for a, for a, for a long time. He's going to come back again. But he left, and where did he go? Revelation chapter 8 and verse, or I should say Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. It says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. In other words, Hebrews chapter 1 to 7, all of that, I'm going to sum it up for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it and put it all into one ball and summarize it. So he says, this is the sum. What is the sum, Paul? We have such an high priest who is set on the majesty, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty, where? In heaven. All right, so Jesus is on the right hand of God in heaven. But there's something in heaven. A minister of the sanctuary. Another word for sanctuary is what? Tabernacle a dwelling place, a minister of the true sanctuary or a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Do you see it? God is telling us here in chapter eight, verse one and two of Hebrews, of the book of Hebrews, that there is a sanctuary in heaven. Friends, this is the pattern that Moses saw. He saw the tabernacle, the sanctuary in heaven. Christ did not yet begin to minister, do his ministry there yet. For we know that after his resurrection, this is what the Bible is telling us. After the resurrection, he then ascended a short time after that to begin his work there. But in the days of Moses, that sanctuary was there. God revealed that sanctuary to Moses or that tabernacle to Moses and told Moses, okay, Moses, this is the pattern in heaven. I want you to build an earthly replica. 
I want you to build a pattern or I want you to build a tabernacle on earth after the pattern of the tabernacle that I'll show you, which is in heaven. Notice, I'll read it again. Now, the things which we have spoken of, the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the mat of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, the tabernacle, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So there is a sanctuary in heaven. A holy place and a most holy place. A sanctuary where now Jesus was interceding. He was doing a work as our great high priest there. And he's still doing that work, by the way. But in the holy place of the sanctuary, there was a seven-branch candlestick. And Revelation chapter 1 begins with Jesus in the midst of that seven-branch candlestick. That tells us where he was in the sanctuary at the beginning of the book of Revelation when John was writing it. Jesus was in the holy place, the second part of the sanctuary. There was the courtyard, there was the holy place, and the most holy place. The seven-branch candlestick was in the holy place. That tells us that at the time John was writing, even at the time he had ascended, Jesus Christ had gone to the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, the sanctuary which the Lord pitched and not man. And so now we're seeing where Jesus was at the beginning of the book of Revelation. He transitions to somewhere else later on. But in the beginning of the book of Revelation, when John was writing the book, friends, Jesus was in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. It continues by telling us, what Jesus was wearing. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Can you imagine that? When he opened his mouth to speak, it sounded probably like multiple voices all at once speaking. It says, his head, hairs of his head white as wool, as white as snow, his eyes were as a flame of fire, feet like fine brass, as it burned in a furnace. And his voice is as the sound of many waters. And he had in his hand, his right hand, seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. And when I saw him, friends, John could not behold a sight. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. Now, continuing, it tells us what the seven candlesticks were and what the seven stars were. We need not guess, friends, at what these things mean. The symbols are unlocked in the Bible. This symbol is unlocked in the book of Revelation itself. What are the seven candlesticks and the seven stars? It tells us, I am he that liveth and was, was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. That is the grave and death. While, no, write the things which thou hast seen. And the things which are. And the things which shall be hereafter. So he's writing concerning his day. And that which will come in the future. The mystery, here it is. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, what do these things represent? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which you saw, are the seven churches. So Jesus Christ, get this, he was standing in the midst, therefore, of the seven candlesticks, right? 
What does that mean? It means that he was standing right at the very midst of all that was taking place in the seven churches. The idea that God was trying to communicate, that Jesus was trying to communicate to John, is that I know what's going on among my people. I'm in the very midst of them. I am right there with them. The persecutions, the apostasy, the falling away from truth, those that are holding on to the truth, those that are suffering for the truth, like John was. The moment at the time when John was writing this, friends, he was writing this because he had been, he was writing this in the midst of persecution. He had actually been sent by Rome, arrested by Rome, and sent to the island of Patmos as an exile to be separated from the rest of the world. And so why? Why was this? Because of his testimony for the word of God. He was testifying of Jesus, and the power that attended his words and works were so powerful that the Roman armies, or the Romans, I should say, saw him as a threat. The Roman government saw him as a threat, so they exiled him to another island, the Isle of Patmos. But even on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus met him there. You may be going through trials in your life today. I tell you the truth. Jesus is there with you. You can be sure the book of Revelation reveals to us this practical truth. That it matters not where we are because of Christ, because of witnessing for Christ. It matters not the persecution or the sufferings that come against us. It matters not even if death comes our way. Christ says, I am he that was once dead, but now I am alive forevermore. In other words, the one who is connected with Christ can be the same for them. Not even death can separate us from God's power. Not even death, friends, can have a firm hold of us. For if we believe in Jesus, we will live again. And when we live again, we will never die again. We will live forever, just like Jesus said concerning himself. So what we've seen here, friends, this is crucial for us. What we've seen are a number of things as it concerns the book of Revelation. Christ holds the angels that lead, that direct the seven churches in his very hands. He stands in the midst of the seven churches, which means he knows what's going on. And he's given us the truths of the book of Revelation because it's concerning not only John's day, history, but things that would happen from John's day onward to the end of time. He tells us that not sad, not fearful or afraid, but happy is the one who studies this book and understands it and keeps it. Therefore, what is this telling us? It's telling us that opposite to what the rest of the Christian world is saying or what much of the Christian world is saying, contrary to that, which is that you can't understand the book, the Bible is telling us we can understand it. We can understand the book of Revelation. And not only that, it comes from the Godhead. God the Father gave it to us through his son. And it's about his son. That means when we're studying this book in our series, we will be looking for Jesus. And it's given through the son to the angel, to the son's angel. And the angel gives it to John and John to the seven churches. These churches represents not only the seven literal churches in John's day, but it represents church ages spanning from John's day all the way to the end of time. The church of Ephesus all the way to the church of Laodicea. And so as we look at this, as we continue in our series, I pray that today's message made sense, friends. God has given us this book for our happiness. God has given us this book that as our minds are illuminated by the Holy Spirit, our hearts might be energized. Our minds might be energized and strengthened. And so with that, let us have at this time then a word of prayer to close this out. And I think as was mentioned, friends, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit those questions. Um, we'll seek to answer them as time goes on. I know that we probably looked over a lot today, 
And there was even more, but I'm sharing with you the main aspects of each chapter so that it can be understood, especially in light of the times in which we live. And so with that, please submit your questions if you have any. But let's have a word of prayer as we at least wrap up for today. Father in heaven, I pray that what we covered made sense, Lord. And as we go into more detail in the future, I pray, Father, that the foundations that we learned here today, that, Lord, it will help us as we move forward. We will see that there are many principles, many truths to be unlocked. So give us wisdom as we do so. Guide us and strengthen us and use us. And as we understand these things, help us to communicate it to others. I pray and I ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.